All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so this lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit more about integral uh, laws for vector fields. Um, next week, there will be no class. Uh, it's Thanksgiving week, so just have a like holiday. Um, and the week after Thanksgiving will be the last week of classes, so you'll have the final exam handed out on Wednesday and due Friday, the week after Thanksgiving. And there will be three final lectures uh, during that week. Okay, so we'll kind of wrap up vector fields and vector calculus. Um, and we might talk a little bit more about linear algebra, inner products, vector spaces, that kind of thing. So kind of just tying up all of the loose ends and getting ready for the next quarter on partial differential equations. Uh, how many of you have had a chance to look through this week's homework yet? Okay, are there any questions on anything in the homework at this point? Yeah? Um, on the first few problems, you ask us to prove a couple things. Do you want yeah. us to, to do that for n dimension spaces, or can we do like 3D spaces? Uh, 3D spaces are fine. Yeah, and when I say prove, I just mean show. Yeah. Uh, any other questions about the homework? No? Okay, cool. So today we're going to talk about Stokes' theorem. Okay, so we talked about Gauss's divergence theorem already, which was super powerful. Uh, Gauss's theorem allowed us to write um, surface integrals of flux through a surface as volume integrals of the divergence in the volume. Okay, that was Gauss's theorem. Today we're going to be talking about Stokes's theorem, which is, I think, probably the most powerful of all of these vector calculus identities. So Stokes's theorem. And there's a lot of really, really, really cool uh, outcomes of Stokes's theorem that we're going to talk about today. So lots of ramifications that we can derive from, from Stokes's theorem. Um, again, I'm going to basically assume that you all know lots of vector calculus. You know how to integrate functions along paths. You know how to integrate surfaces and volumes. And we're going to be talking about the high-level kind of theorems that relate these surface integrals to volume integrals and line integrals to surface integrals and things like that. Okay, that's what these, these really are. So Stokes' theorem essentially says that if I have some surface, let's call the surface S, and if I have some boundary to the surface, so we're going to denote boundaries by partial s. This is just the math notation for boundary. Then the integral around this surface of some vector field is equal to the surface integral of the curl of that vector field. So let me write this down, and then we'll, we'll talk about what each, each term means. So the integral around the boundary of S, and this is kind of a closed contour integral, if you like, of my vector field F dotted with some little vector. Um, this is a vector DS. Is equal to the surface integral over the entire surface S of the curl of F times some, uh, some area term, okay, ds. Okay, so let's talk about what this means. Um, again, I'm not going to prove this. I'm going to sketch kind of why this is true, but you know, for a proof, you should see a, like a vector calculus book. The idea is that if I have some vector field, remember this is like a vector field might be the flow field in the ocean, or it might be, you know, I, maybe I have some point charges, or I have a transformer that I'm energizing, and it's creating some electromagnetic field. That's also a vector field. And so I have arrows at every point in space for my vector field, F. And if I integrate that vector field along the surface, so I figure out how much of that vector field is pointing in the direction of this boundary, and I integrate around the entire boundary, that's exactly equal to the integral of the area of the whole surface of the curl of my vector field. Okay, so this is an area just, this is an integral just around the surface. 
of f dotted with this surface vector. And that contour integral is equal to this two-dimensional uh, surface integral of the curl of my vector field. Okay, so let's draw a picture to see kind of why this makes sense. Um, one way that I like to think about this, and this is kind of the most common picture I've seen before, is let's say we take our surface S and we chop it up into a bunch of really small boxes. Okay, so I'm going to just draw a bunch of, I mean, they're not ridiculously small, but they're going to be kind of small. Small boxes. Okay? Now, remember, if I had a vector field F that had some positive divergence, maybe divergence equals 1, what did that look like locally? What did a vector field with a positive divergence look like? All the arrows were kind of starbursting out from the center, right? So this was kind of like arrows just going out, right? What did a vector field with a positive curl look like? Things rotating. Things were spinning around, right? So this looked like, you know, I had some, some rotation, right? Like if I dropped something in this vector field, it would rotate around. It wouldn't just flee from the origin. It would rotate around the origin. So if I compute the curl kind of at each of these, imagine I made these boxes really, 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 really small you know, teeny tiny boxes. Then if I computed the curl in these boxes, I would basically be measuring how much the vector field does this locally. I would be measuring how much locally the vector field rotates versus spreads. Okay? And so I can draw that for all of these little boxes. And in this direction, it looks like this. And in this direction, it looks like this, and so on and so forth. I'm going to try to draw a few of them so we get the picture across. OK, so I draw what the curl, this is essentially curl of f at that point. That's kind of a pictorial view of what curl at this point looks like. And so what happens if I add all of these curls up? So what happens is, most of these arrows cancel out. Okay, so the vector field, you know, the curl portion of this box and this box have equal and opposite components on that, on that interface. And they have equal and opposite components on this interface and this interface. And every, every interior line, the curl from the right box cancels the curl from the left box. And the curl from the top box cancels the curl from the bottom box. Right? My arrows are pointing to the right and to the left. And if I integrate over these, if I integrate over this path, plus the integral over this path, plus the integral over this path, I get a bunch of equal and opposite paths that cancel out. Okay, so this integral of my whole volume of the curl of f ds Every single interior black line cancels out. And all I have left is this contour integral of these surface boundaries. The only pieces that don't have equal and opposite contributions are these arrows that are on the outside. All of these um, arrows are not canceled. And so what I get is the integral around the boundary of f dotted with that tangent surface vector. OK? OK, there are probably questions about why this is true. Any questions at this point? So I think something that would help a little bit is to say that this curl really does equal. So the curl of f at a point, the curl of f at some point x is equal to the contour integral. Let's say I have this point x 
if I did a contour integral around that point, some contour C, and it was really, 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 really small contour of f dot ds, then that equals the curl at that point. Okay, this is a, a property. You can actually derive this, um, this property that the curl of my vector field at that point x is essentially equal to this contour integral as I make that contour smaller and smaller and smaller around my point x. Okay? So integrating up all of the curls at every point in this boundary is like adding up all of these little contour integrals, these little square contour integrals. But all of the interior square contour integrals cancel out. Right? The up and the down components cancel, the left and the right components cancel, and all that's left are the parts that don't have an equal and opposite on the surface. Okay? And so this is essentially um, the pictorial reason why we have Stokes' theorem. Okay, it's not a proof, um, but it's kind of a geometric idea for why this is true. Okay, but Stokes' theorem is extremely useful. If you like, you can just take this identity for granted. This is a fundamental mathematical truth. It can be proved that if I wanted to take the integral around the boundary of a surface, that would equal the surface integral of the curl of that vector field inside the surface. Okay? So this is starting to look a lot like Gauss's theorem, right? I had some integral on a lower dimensional surface, and that tells me about something about the, you know, the kind of volume or area integral inside that surface, the enclosed integral. So it turns out, actually, if you eventually learn about like tensor calculus and tensor math, the divergence theorem, Gauss's divergence theorem, is actually just a special case of Stokes' theorem. It's really hard to see why that's true without a lot more math. Um, but it is true that Stokes' theorem kind of is the master vector calculus theorem that contains Gauss's theorem, Green's theorem, and Stokes' theorem. Um, and the Russian guy's name was Ostrogradsky. Ostrogradsky also invented the divergence theorem. Okay, so a special case of uh, Stokes' theorem. This also applies to higher dimensions than just three dimensions. Um, but usually we're going to be thinking about this in 2D or 3D okay, for, for this class. And so in 2D, we have Green's theorem. And Green's theorem is pretty, um, pretty similar. I mean, it's exactly the same thing as Stokes' theorem, just applied in 2D. So uh, let's say I have my vector field F equals F1 and F2. So this is the component in the X direction, and F2 is the component in the Y direction. These are scalar functions. This is a vector function. Then what we have is, remember we have this surface S and a boundary partial S. So the integral around the surface of f dot ds. So in 2D, this is the same thing as the integral around the boundary of the surface of f1 dx plus f2 dy. Okay. So if I want to just take my vector function f and I want to integrate it around the surface, dotting it into the tangent at each point, that's this integral here, integral around the surface of f1 dx plus f2 dy, then that equals the surface integral of the curl of this vector field, right? Okay, so what's the curl of my vector field f? How do I do, what's the curl of f? What direction does the curl point in? Sorry? Z, right? It points out of the board, right? Because my vector field has an x component and a y component. So if I curl that vector field, it has to point out of the board in the z direction. 
And what's the magnitude of that out of the board direction? Partial F1 partial Y minus partial F2 partial X. Okay. So this is uh, minus partial F1 partial Y, sorry, plus minus partial F2 partial X. And that's all in the K direction, right? In the DZ direction, if you like. So this equals my surface integral of partial F2. I think I messed up the sign, sorry. Partial F2 partial X minus partial F1 partial Y integrated around the entire surface. So now I have a DX and a DY, a double integral DX DY, right? I'm integrating over this entire surface now, every interior point. I'm going to add up the curl of the vector field at that point times the little area of that rectangle. And that's how I can relate the integral around the curve to the integral of the curl inside the surface. So this is just kind of in 2D, if we actually wrote down the components of our vector field, the x and y components, we can write it down explicitly. This is Stokes' theorem in 2D. Okay, and so if you had some, if I gave you a function f1 and f2, you could actually compute these integrals. Um, so let's do an example uh, where we where we start doing this. Okay. So there's one nice um, implication about there's I think two or three really direct uses for Stokes' theorem, and I'm going to try to get through all of them today. So the first use of Stokes' theorem, let's uh, say, the first use is computing the area. Okay? So I can actually compute the area inside of a surface by integrating around the surface if I choose my vector field carefully. Okay? So let's say that the area of S, what is the area of S equal? But how do I compute the area of my surface S? I mean, I would integrate over my area 1 times dx dy. Right? If I wanted to find the area of my surface, I would literally just integrate dx dy over that surface, and I would get the area of S. Okay? Now, I'm going to go um, backwards a little bit. I'm going to say let my vector field F equal minus Y and X. So I'm choosing this vector field. I have the choice to do this. I'm choosing this vector field so that it has a curl equal to positive 2. So curl of F equals partial this partial x minus partial this partial y, which is positive 2. Okay? So I can write this integral as uh, 1 half surface integral of 2 dx dy if I want. And remember, I can take my Stokes' theorem and say that my surface integral of the curl of my vector field is equal to the contour integral of my vector field dotted in the normal direction. So this equals one half of my contour integral of f dotted in the uh, s direction. So let's talk about how we got to this step. So this is pretty straightforward. The area of S is just the integral of 1 over that area. That's equal to 1 half of the integral of 2 over that area, right? No problem. 2 is the curl of my vector field, OK? And we know that the, the surface integral of the curl of my vector field, dx, dy, 
is equal to the contour integral of my vector field dot ds. Right, this is just Stokes' theorem. The, the surface integral of the curl of my vector field is equal to the contour integral of my vector field dot ds. So I just chose this vector field arbitrarily because it has really nice properties, that its curl is a constant. So I can use it to get this area. Okay? And so now I finally have that this is one half integral over this boundary of S of F dotted with DS. So that's minus Y DX plus X DY. This is my f dot ds, minus y in the dx direction and x in the dy direction. So let's just, so the first part, the, the key here is that the area of s can be written as one half of a contour integral around the surface of x dy minus y dx. This is kind of cool. If I have any arbitrary area S, you give me some area. If I simply take this special vector field, this vector field that has curl 2, and I integrate that vector field around the contour bounding S, that will always give me the area inside of S. So this is a way of computing the area of a nasty shape without actually doing a double integral. This is a single integral. Okay, just a path integral around the boundary gives me the area inside. That's pretty cool. Sorry, any, okay, questions about this? Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna solve this. Um, I'm guessing x and y are gonna be defined. Are they gonna be defined in the vector space? Like you're kind of saying there. Yeah, so, so x and y literally are you know, coordinates in, in this vector space. And so what, we, what I would have to tell you is how can I parameterize this boundary? I need to give you a parameterization of this boundary in terms of x and y so that you can then make that integral. So let's do an example. This will make a lot of sense when we do an example. And it's kind of a cool example. Um, Unfortunately, all of these integral examples, the math gets a little hairy at the end, but the basic idea is still pretty cool. So we're going to find the area inside of a, a really, really important geometric object called a hypocycloid. Okay. Does anyone know what a hypocycloid looks like? Hypocycloids are super cool. You should Google them. I did. They're awesome. Okay, let's use a color here. Um, so the idea of a hypocycloid is that it's kind of this funny looking shape like this. It's kind of this star shape pattern. Okay. And I want to know the area inside of this hypocycloid. Now, this is a pretty nasty double integral. If you actually do this using you know, integral over x and y, dx, dy, it's a real pain. And so this is a great example of using Stokes' theorem. So what I'm going to do is integrate my nice special curl equals 2 vector field around the boundary of this hypocycloid. And it's going to tell me what the area inside has to be by Stokes' theorem. Uh, hypocycloids, uh, how many of you play with spirographs when you were kids? Yeah, so um, spirographs are awesome. Hypocycloids are what you get from spirographs, basically. If you take uh, like a circle and you have another circle that's moving inside of it and you have a little hole where you can drop your pen and as you rotate this thing around, this circle is spinning inside the big circle and it traces out, I can't really do it, but it traces out this hypocycloid. Okay, and if you get the radius of this circle with respect to this circle at different ratios of the radius, you get like 
more sides to the starfish. You might get five or six or seven or ten or whatever, however many sides of the starfish. They have great properties. They're not just kids' toys. Um, these hypocycloids are also used, um, believe it or not, these are used in image compression. They're used for, uh, if I have a satellite image of your license plate and it's really blurry and I only can pick out a, fi a few pixels, there are transformations like the fast Fourier transform but that use hypocycloids that allow me to fill in what your license plate has to be based on the information I get. Okay, this is something I'll tell you all about in ME565. But hypocycloids are super cool. So let's find the uh, area of this hypocycloid using Stokes' theorem. Okay? Let's not do it in red. Okay, so the hypocycloid is a surface that's defined by the following uh, equation. X to the 2 thirds plus y to the 2 thirds equals some a to the 2 thirds. You can think of a as the radius of this thing, kind of. Okay, so this is the point a0, this is the point 0a, and so on. So a is the scale factor of how big this hypocycloid is, the radius, if you like. Um, I can change this hypocycloid by changing this power. I could have 2 fifths, and then I would have more weird curves. If I had 2 sevenths, then I would have 7 faces. Uh, things like that. Try out different hypocycloids. And to your question earlier, what we're going to do is we're going to parametrize the contour bounding this hypocycloid by some parameter so that I can actually integrate that contour integral. Okay, so we're going to parametrize. And we're going to parametrize by some variable theta that goes from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so we're essentially making some mapping that is kind of like a circle. So x is going to equal a cos cubed of theta. y is going to equal a sine cubed of theta. And you can verify that if I take the x to the 2 thirds plus y to the 2 thirds, then I get a to the 2 thirds times cos squared plus sine squared. Okay, so this parameterization satisfies this hypocycloid equation. And we're going to integrate from theta equals uh, 0 to 2 pi. So you could code this up in MATLAB. This is actually a great exercise. You should do this. I should have thought to do this. Um, literally just in MATLAB, make a vector theta from 0 to 2 pi in increments of 0.01 and plot this x-coordinate versus this y-coordinate and you will get this hypocycloid. And you could even, if you wanted to, dot the, you could actually compute this contour integral numerically in MATLAB and show that it equals the area that we're going to derive on paper. Okay? So I would recommend doing this in MATLAB. You can compute the area of this thing by doing this, uh, this contour integral, and I think it's kind of a good idea to do. Okay, so from Stokes' theorem, what we have is the, um, let's call this the area, is A. Then A is going to equal one half of the integral around the boundary of, let's call it the boundary of A, of x dy minus y dx. Not too bad. Okay, this is, I literally just wrote down what we derived. We use Stokes' theorem to get a formula for the area of S. We're integrating um, our nice curl equals 2 vector field around this contour. And we get this expression. This is my curl equals 2 vector field. And now what we're going to do is we're going to compute dy and dx. So let's do that. Uh, let's say dx equals minus 3a cos squared sine, both of theta, d theta. Okay. Tell me if I make a mistake, because this is easy to make a mistake. 3a sine squared theta cos theta d theta. Right, that's dx and dy as a function of d theta. 
And now my integral around the boundary is no longer an integral of dy dx, but it's an integral of d theta from 0 to 2 pi. So this is you know, something we all learned in uh, like vector calculus. So this is equal to 1 half of the integral from 0 to 2 pi of x dy minus y dx, which is this nasty expression. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, OK. Um, x dy is 3 a squared sine squared cos to the fourth, of course, of theta, minus y dx. So minus minus is another plus 3 a squared cos squared sine to the fourth. times d theta, because both of these have a d theta. I went a little fast. Um, but this is just x times dy minus y times dx. That's this. So now we've taken this nasty hypocycloid, where I don't even know exactly how I would do this integral over this surface. That would be a nasty, horrible integral, surface integral. And I turned it into a relatively innocuous contour integral around this parameterized curve, parameterized by 0 to 2 pi in theta. And we could go through all of the steps and solve this, and it's you know, not terribly illustrative to do. Um, I mean, how many of you want me to integrate this sines and cosines? It's a mess. It's in my notes, and the answer is, but it's not hard. right? It's, it's relatively straightforward. These are all things we know how to integrate. And so the final answer, we end up getting something like 3 eighths pi a squared. Okay, And we can do that by going from a nasty surface integral to this relatively simpler contour integral of the curl of my vector field, of my vector field that has curl equal to 2. OK, so kind of a simple um, example. This is the first major use of Stokes' theorem. Not that simple of an example. Um, OK, so that's cute. It's not that useful. It's kind of useful. I'm sure you know, at some point you might find this useful. But there's a lot better uses for Stokes' theorem. Um, Stokes' theorem is extremely useful in fluid mechanics and in electromagnetics. Um, and in quantum mechanics, and in special and general relativity. So it's really, really useful in physics. Um, any system where things rotate, or have spin, or you know, if you have a charge in a magnetic field, it does a helix. right? That's the curl of the, that vector. Um, in fluid mechanics, if you have a piece of fluid particle in a tornado, it also has a positive curl. And so what Stokes' theorem allows you to do is it allows you to write the um, circulation inside of a closed contour as a double integral of the curl inside that closed contour. Lots and lots of physics applications. Anytime anything rotates, you can use Stokes' theorem, basically. Okay? Um, so pick your favorite physics. Things rotate. Electromagnetics, fluid mechanics, um, quantum mechanics, and so on. But what's even, I think, kind of more interesting, so let's say use 2 is physics with rotation. Okay. We're going to look at this more in fluid mechanics. For example, um, I'm sure some of you have studied Kelvin circulation theorem, something you use in fluids in the Navier-Stokes equation. So if you want to figure out the um, power output of a wind turbine, or if you want to think about the lift on a helicopter, you need to be thinking about total circulation and use Stokes' theorem to do that. Um, we'll talk more about this later. But what I want to talk about t right now is use 3, which is this. You can use Stokes' theorem for physics without rotation. OK, so let's think about what, what I mean by this. Um, uh, 
OK. So I have some vector field. And I'm going to draw this vector field V so that it doesn't look like it has any curl. Okay? This doesn't really seem to have any curl going on. Okay? I could also draw a vector field like the gravitational potential that also doesn't have any curl. Right? Everything just points in towards the center of the Earth. So what do we know from Stokes' theorem? Stokes' theorem tells us that if I take some arbitrary closed curve, Okay, some arbitrary closed curve, partial s. We know that the integral over that boundary of my closed curve, this path integral around my closed curve of my vector field, equals what? What does Stokes' theorem tell me that this equals? Okay, double integral, I'm going to integrate over the entire area enclosed by S of. Yeah, good. Curl of F. Uh, let's just call it dx dy, ds, okay? Now, I told you that this vector field had no curl. So this has to equal 0. OK? So this is, I'm writing this in green because this is called a conservative vector field. And we're conserving things that seems green. So what we have is if the curl of f equals 0, then this closed integral of f ds always equals 0 for all closed curves partial s. This is huge. This is called uh, then f is called a conservative vector field. Okay. So if my vector field has no curl, if I have a fluid where nothing is swirling, there's no rotation, there's no vorticity, if I have some electromagnetic potential where if I drop a particle in it, that particle doesn't, doesn't spin around or anything, if I have a vector field V or F so that the curl is zero everywhere, then I can take the closed path integral around any closed path partial s of my vector field, and it will always equal 0. Okay, These are an incredibly important class of vector fields called conservative vector fields. And they have huge properties. So for example, the gravitational potential is a conservative vector field. And the physical meaning of what it, what it means to be conservative is, um, let's say I draw Earth. Okay? And let's say that I build the world's largest, most awesome roller coaster. This is going to be pretty awesome. Okay? It's huge. If there was no friction in my system, if all so this is that mass on a wire right? that we had on the midterm and in the first half of the class. This is just my mass on a wire. And it satisfies some equation, you know, x double dot equals uh, what force equals mass times acceleration. So this equals minus partial v partial x, where v is my conservative vector field. Uh, this is my conservative vector field. And it always points inward towards the Earth. So if I think about the particle on a wire or the roller coaster with no friction, what it means for to be a conservative vector field is that I have the same energy at every point along this curve. 
Okay, so if I start at the top of this roller coaster hill and I go down, I'll go through the whole track and I will eventually come right back up to the top with exactly the same amount of energy. I will have no energy gained or lost integrating around this closed curve of my conservative vector field. Okay, so conservative vector fields are huge. They're not just useful in gravitational potentials, they're also useful. Um, I mean, they are very, very useful in gravitational potentials. We use the conservative vector field approximation anytime we look at asteroids and comets and spacecraft because there's very low friction environments and they're in a gravitational potential, which is conservative, which is why Halley's Comet comes back so repeatedly after the same amount of years because it basically has the same energy always. Um, and this is a general statement of any vector field that has zero curl everywhere, it is a conservative vector field. It's the same as our gravitational potential, or same as our frictionless roller coaster. Okay? So there are fluid analogies that have curl zero. They're like the frictionless roller coaster. If I start my fluid and I move it to some other state and then I move it back, then there's no energy gained or lost. Um, okay, now let's go a little bit deeper into this. So I think that on Monday after Thanksgiving, I'm going to tell you about potential flow fields, which is going to be another simple example of a partial differential equation that we actually are fully equipped to solve right now. And the potential flow is, so potential flow theory is essentially a conservative fluid system. This is our, one of our oldest analogies for fluid dynamics. Um, it's been used since the 1850s. And all of the early aircraft wings and aircraft bodies were designed using potential flow theory until about the 50s. Okay? So this conservative potential flow uh, has a huge amount of engineering application, even though it's an approximation of a real fluid system or a real roller coaster system. You, very, very useful approximation. You can build airplanes using these conservative vector field approximations. We'll talk about that next, next, next Monday. Um, but before we do, I want to get a little deeper into what are some properties of these special vector fields that have no curl. Okay? Uh, I asked you on the homework to prove two vector identities, and I don't remember exactly what they were. What were they? Okay, I know, I remember one of them, not the important one, that, that if you take the curl of the cross product of A and B, that it's orthogonal to both A and B. Okay, what was the other vector identity? <laughs> The curl of the gradient is equal, yeah, right. So I think it is that the curl of the gradient is equal to zero. Is that right? Let's just double check. Pretty sure it's this, right? I think it has to be. OK, um, homework five. No, I asked you to show that the divergence of the curl is equal to zero. Okay, well, I didn't ask you to solve the useful one anyway. Um, sorry about that. So you could also show that this is definitely true. The curl of the gradient of some scalar potential is always equal to zero. This is actually really one of the most important ones. Okay, this is extremely important. Two star important, okay? You can prove that this is true. So if I had some scalar function phi, then I can get a vector function. We can call this my vector field is the gradient of that scalar function. Partial phi, partial x in the x direction. Partial phi, partial y in the y direction. Partial phi, partial z in the z direction. You could write this as you know, f equals partial phi, partial x, partial phi, partial y, partial phi, partial z. You could also write this as, you know, partial phi, partial x in the i direction, in the j direction, and in the k direction. Or if we were integrating around a contour, we would say dx, dy, dz. We'd be integrating in the dx, dy, and dz directions. Okay, so what this tells me is that if 
if my vector field f is the gradient of some potential function phi, I'm calling it a potential function because it satisfies this conservative potential field kind of um, scenario. If my vector field is the curl of a potential function, then f is conservative because the curl of f is equal to 0, right? The curl of this f is definitely equal to 0. You can verify it, you know, just using calculus and the chain rule. Then if this f is the gradient of some scalar function, then f is conservative. These are super, super, super special vector fields. So for example, in the um, particle on a bead example, right, we have some mass on this bead on a wire. Then the potential phi was the gravitational potential, um, which I guess was some you know, x squared minus x to the fourth or something like that. And so my grad phi, my vector field, was just partial phi partial x, which was 2x minus 4x cubed. And so I could drop a particle in that vector field, and I had x double dot equals 2x minus 4x cubed. I think there's a minus minus. But anyway, I can derive the equations for this bead on a wire using this potential function. And because this really is, because my vector field really is the gradient of a scalar potential, that vector field has curl 0. And so it's conservative. If I drop this bead, then it will go exactly to the same height. And then it'll come back and go exactly to the same height. Over a closed path, energy is neither created nor destroyed for these uh, conservative gradient systems. Okay, Extremely important set of systems. So what we want is we want the curl of our vector field to equal 0 for it to be conservative, for energy to be conserved. If our vector field is the gradient of some scalar potential, then we're guaranteed to have this 0 curl. And so this is guaranteed to be a conservative vector field, which means that the closed integral over any closed curve of f is equal to 0. Okay, if I have my earth here, if I take and I lift a mass and then I bring it back down to the same height that I started with, then the integral of this closed curve has to be equal to 0 inside this conservative vector field. Okay, so a couple things I haven't told you. I haven't really told you why energy is conserved. I've said that this is a conservative vector field, and what conservative conservation means is that the integral of f ds equals 0. Um, I mean, the reason that energy is conserved is because this potential function is conserved. And here, potential really means potential energy. So if I take a mass and I lift it up, and then I bring it back down, then my potential energy is the same as it was when I started. That's why we call these potential fields or conservative fields, conservation of potential energy. And so this idea of a curl-free vector field really generalizes this basic fundamental intuition that we have about uh, you know, conservation of potential energy around a closed curve. OK, we're going to talk a lot more about this. Um, I think you should take some time to really understand why Stokes' theorem is true. Code up the example on the hypocycloid and make sure that you can plot it and actually numerically add up f dotted in the tangent direction, in the dx, dy direction, numerically calculate that integral, and make sure you get you know, 8 thirds pi a squared, or whatever the answer was. Um, and start thinking about these conservative vector fields. This is going to be really, really important um, later in the class. We're going to go deeper into this. OK, have a great Thanksgiving. I will see you all in a few days, 8 or so, or 7 or 9, something. All right, bye.